We're going to move along to Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to read in verse number 15, 15 through 20. I'm going to read verses 15 through 20. Let's go ahead and read. It says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. This is not good news for the church. All right, you, you, may, be, you may sit down. Um, it was just this one verse that I'm going to read, then we're going to continue diving into this. But Jesus is in the middle of discipleship. He's really talking about some deep things to the disciples. He's in the middle of discipling them in the right way, in the right things. And now he is trying to help them understand how to recognize people. How to recognize the sons of God. How to recognize true um, godly um, leadership or messengers. Because he's preparing them because he's going to leave. So he's preparing them so that they will know how can I recognize the truth? How can I recognize the real from the fake, right? And why does he have to do this? Because they're, they're surrounded by something that Jesus is calling fake. They're surrounded by the Pharisees and Sadducees. They're surrounded by appearances. They're surrounded by tremendous appearance. And, and so Jesus constantly is talking to them. He, when he talks to the Pharisees, he says, you guys look clean on the outside. But inside, you are dead man's bones. You're white sepulchers, pretty much. Very bright and shiny and beautiful on the outside. But inside, there's something that's not right. Inside, there's death. Inside, there's no life. But if you talk to a Pharisee, they wouldn't think that. They would think that they're very well alive. They would think that they are full of life and truth and godliness And zeal for righteousness. That's, that's what they thought. But Jesus is looking at them, telling them, no, you look pretty cool outside. You got the long white robes. In another scripture, it says, you know, woe unto you Pharisees. You like to wear the long robes. You like to wear the very long robes. But it's just an appearance. It's just a show. Right? So here, he is with his disciples, and now he's trying to lead them into the right way. How to discern, how to discern honesty from something that is fake. So I think today, we can learn a lot from this in our culture. Because I think we deal with the same thing in 2016. We're dealing with appearances. We're dealing with people That we don't know if you are real or not. We don't know what are you following. We don't know if your intentions are right. We don't know if you are deceived. We don't know if you are a deceiver. So Jesus is telling them, beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. So what is Jesus saying? They come to you dressed right. They come to you looking like a sheep. They come to you with an appearance. But inwardly, you see the word inwardly? Inwardly, they're wolves. I think this is a key word. Because you see, you and I don't see inwardly. We see outwardly. But Jesus sees inwardly. So when he's seeing inwardly, he's saying, I see something else. I see something that your eyes cannot see. And I'm seeing a wolf. 
So be very careful. And then he starts expounding a little bit more about it. Verse number 16. Here's the biggest key. You shall know them. Let's go to the ESV, please. Because I like the better, I like this better. This English will be even more relevant for us. You will recognize them by their fruits. You will recognize them by their fruits. This is, this is like our, our most important teaching here for discernment. Jesus is saying, don't discern things according to the outwardly. Or we would say, don't judge things according to the outwardly. Judge according to what? Fruit. Right? Judge according to fruit. That's the most important thing, the way we need to judge. There's many people out there that, for example, I'm, I'm just going to give an example. There's many people out there that may dress right on the pulpit. May have, you know, the, the, the tie very well, beautiful, everything, the, a white crisp shirt and everything. And at the same time, be embezzling money from the church. And now, is that a big tale? No, I mean, it's happened over and over and over and over. So it's not, it, it happens all the time. It comes out on the news. We see it on papers. And, and so if we are to judge outwardly by presentation, by the sermon, by the emotion, by the looks, everything points out man of God. Right? We have no clue what that person is doing in his personal life, right? So what does Jesus say? Don't judge according to what you see as far as appearance. Judge according to what you see in the fruit. Fruit. What you see in fruit. That's the most important part. That's how you begin to discern the life of people. That's why there's a very important scripture. And I tell this to people. When we start, you know, just, you know, following preachers blindly. There's another scripture that says, know them that labor among you. Know them that labor among you. What does that mean? Don't just know their looks, but it says know their fruit. Know what they are. Know, know their lives. That's, a very, that's what's going to let you know if you are in a safe place or not, right? It's when you judge things according to the fruit. So here he's saying, you will recognize them by their fruit. And then he says, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? It's pretty much saying, you know, you're not going to see a grape uh, coming from this type of bush. It comes from a grape, grape tree or grape bush. It says, so every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. Verse 18, where, I'm sorry, um, uh, 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 bad fruit, yeah, verse 18. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. You will recognize them by their fruits. Now, this is very, very key here, too. I'm going to pull out. A couple of, I want, you to, I want you to hear this. This is from um, the pulpit commentary, speaking of this, of, on verse 16, when the Lord is saying, you will recognize them by their fruits. It says, their appearance and their claims are no proof of their true character. Their appearance and their claim are not, are no proof of true of their true character somebody can be telling you look right and be telling you i do this i believe in this i stand for this but he says that that, that is no proof of true character what does that sound like it sounds like politics right politicians where imagine if we were to follow politicians upon what they say i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that are they going to probably not because when they get into power, it's a complete different world that 
don't they'll understand that probably 90% of what they wanted to do is impossible because of government. It's huge and, and, and there's so many elements in government. So we have to be we we have to be careful even in the normal lives because that's the image a lot of times politicians have gotten. What the image that they just lie to get elected. That's I mean in, in our countries in South America, Central America uh, for sure. I mean it's like they, they're gonna give you the whole world, the whole country. And then it's like, okay, thank you for getting me elected. So that is, why have they gotten that image? Because it's been a lot of talk. Because it's been a lot of promotion, a lot of claims, a lot of appearance. But at the end, so in, in, in personal lives, in our daily lives, we have to be careful to start seeing things by just mere appearance. Appearance and looks are deceitful. Amen? They're deceitful. So it may seem, and then, he, and then uh, the pulpit commentary says, it may seem difficult to recognize this, yet there is a sure way of doing so. It may seem difficult to recognize people then. But then Spencer Jones says, there is a sure way to do so. There is a sure way to recognize them. And he finishes by saying, by their life. By their their life not by the appearance by their life they will be recognized so the lord is trying to guide them and telling them be careful when you start looking and when you start judging things according to the mere eye according to the mere appearance because there's something far more important and it's called fruit fruit is the most important thing that we can see and a lot of times, many people fall into just a life of appearance. They just fall into a life of seeing things, of wanting to look right, wanting to fall into an appearance, wanting to fall into a facade. But they always forget about fruit. Fruit. For example, there was a, my wife and I were talking yesterday about a friend a distant friend that, that she has. That this, this girl was talking to my wife, telling them one time that she couldn't wait to leave the work, her secular job, and be uh, full-time in a church. She couldn't wait to do that so that um, she could not, or so that she wouldn't need to be around sinners. So she couldn't wait to leave her job, and just work full-time at a church so that I don't have to be around these people. I don't have to be around the sinners, or many people call them the heathen, right? I don't want to be around people that are sinners. Why would we ever feel that way, and why would we ever think that way? You know why? Because we are so far out from understanding the gospel and understanding Jesus. And we have focused so much on image, appearance, that we forget what this gospel is all about. We forget what the truth is about. The truth is not about image. The truth is about action. The truth is about character. Right? That's why there's something called the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is what lets us know we are walking with God. We're walking in the Spirit. Not because we are following, you know, a, 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 a set of things, but we're actually following Jesus and we're trying to get His fruit. For example, look in Matthew 7 verse 1, how He starts. Matthew 7 and verse number 1. He says, judge not that you be not judged. This is the same chapter that we're reading. For with the same judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. You see that? That's right. That's the chapter we're in. Chapter 7. It says, with the same measure... You use, it will be measured to you. The same way you measure, 
is the same way you are going to be measured. You see that? Who is Jesus talking about? Any clues? What people? Huh? The Pharisees. Why? Because they were very hard with people. Measuring them and judging them. Say, oh, you don't look like this. Oh, you don't do this. You don't, you don't fast this day. You don't wash your hands. You don't have this type of robe. You, you don't do this. Everything was about an appearance. Prayer was an appearance. Fasting was an appearance. Giving was an appearance. Dressing was an appearance. Everything was a show. But, it, but they were very hard with people. And if they didn't have it, if they didn't have what they require, then it's going to be a problem. They were very hard with people. So Jesus, in, in the midst of them, he's saying, with the same judgment you pronounce. Imagine, this is God in the flesh looking at these Pharisees. And he's saying, this, I'm, you guys are going to be judged the same way. The same way that you are measuring them, you're going to be measured this way. It's going to be measured to you. Verse number three. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It says you got to be very careful. You got to be very careful with the way that you are judging people around you because that's the way that you are going to be judged. That's exactly the way you will be judged according to the same way. Now, very, very important here is that later on, Jesus is talking again to other people. He's talking, he's talking to his disciples and he's continuing to teach. And, and one, one of the things that, one of the things that, that Jesus starts doing is when, when he's talking to, to his disciples and he's trying to, to tell them about how to go into the world, how to affect the world, how to lead people into the world. This is in chapter 9, and we're going to read in verse number 36. Look what happens in... Or actually, let's, let's go down to verse number 9. Let's start in verse number 9. It says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were... I want you to notice that word. As Jesus... Recline at the table in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and what? And sinners came and were what? Reclining with Jesus and his disciples. They were not just sitting. They were reclining. That means that they were in a very personal manner. They were like, very personal with each other. It's not a cold setting. It's a warm setting. It's a very warm setting. They were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? It's like the girl that I'm talking to you about. That She's like, I don't, I don't want to work around heathens. I don't want to work around sinners. They were asking that. Why is Jesus reclining with these sinners? Why is Jesus hanging out with these sinners and, and with these dirty people? When I was studying this scripture, I realized something that to the, to the Pharisees, there was people that for sure had probably sinned in their life in this setting. People that they knew to be thieves. People that they knew to be uh, maybe in illicit relationships. But at the same time, there was people who simply were not following the rules. And the Pharisees call anybody that did not follow the rules, they call them sinners. So sinners to the Pharisees were not just the people that were in idolatry or adultery. No, to them sinners were anybody 
who did not follow every rule that they had. And it's interesting, the scholars even say that those rules were according to their personal interpretation of the scriptures. Those rules were according to their personal interpretations of the scriptures. So it's saying, they're calling them sinners. And I remember I was talking to a friend of mine one time, this is months ago, and, and he was telling me, he was talking about actually somebody that comes to this church. And, and this is a pastor from another town. No, you guys don't even know who I'm talking about, so that's great. And, 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 and he's, he's telling me that he saw one of our ladies walking on the street, and he says, is she okay? Because she was not dressed like a Christian. And I was like, what do you mean? And he started describing, he says, okay, so you just saw her on the street, you immediately said that's not a Christian. Because it doesn't have an outfit or a uniform. It's not a Christian. And, and he's like, yeah, she, she, she didn't have the uniform. So she was not a Christian. And, and I was like, that, that's exactly how the Pharisees thought. That's how they thought. They thought that that's not a Christian. That's not a follower. That's not a, a holy person. Why? Look at them. What is it? The look at them means they're not following my rules. See that? They're not following my rules. Therefore, it equals that they are not from God. They're not from the Lord. So this is the Pharisees' perfect example saying, why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 12, he says, but when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, go and learn. This is powerful. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. My word, Jesus took him right to the book of Hosea. They, they know what he's quoting. If they knew the scriptures, there's probably scribes around them. Scribes are the masters in the scriptures of the Old Testament. The guys that copy them. So he's telling them, hey, why don't you do a homework? Go and read Hosea. When the Lord says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. This is powerful. Actually, there is not, this is not the only scripture that talks that something is above sacrifice. There's another scripture in Chronicles that says obedience is better than what? Than sacrifice. Here it says, I don't want sacrifice. I want mercy. Because if you think about the life of the Pharisees, it was full of sacrifice. In a way, oh, we don't wash our hands. We got to wash our hands. Everything was this religious um, um, rites and rituals that were very ascetic. Ascetic. It's an ascetic lifestyle where everything is, is about crucif the denial of the flesh. Nothing is good. Nothing is right. Later on, the Gnosticism came along and it, and it, was, it was being like, a, like, like venom on the church with the same manner of thinking. You know what the Gnostics were teaching? Paul later on has to refute the Gnostics. The Gnostics started saying, we cannot get married. Remember when, when in Timothy it says, in the last days, there's going to be doctrines of devils? It's forbidding marriage? That's Gnosticism. Gnosticism taught that you could not get married. You got you to gotta live a life separated from anything that's worldly, anything that's, that's natural. It's all evil. Separate from marriage. Separate from meats. It's, it's kind of like Buddhism. It's very similar to Buddhism. It all comes from that same root, that Gnosticism, and that, it all comes from the same place. So he's saying the, 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 these people were living ascetic lives. And so that's sacrifice, right? I'll tell you, it's sacrifice to be a vegetarian if you like meat. Because I like meat. And I did it for a year, and... I, I remember one day when I used to practice Buddhism. I came out of one day, I'm driving, a year already of vegetarian. I'm driving, I see Wendy's, and I go, <laughs> It's like, I'm going to eat some burger today. That, why? Because I was hungry for meat. And I was doing it for a year. 
But why was I doing it? To get my mind clear, to get my mind restored because of all the drugs that I did. So I wanted my mind to be renewed. And that's what they taught me. You need to not eat meat. You need to abstain from all these things so that your mind balances again. So I'm like, one day I gave up. I was like, this is not working. It's not doing it. My mind is not getting better. So I might as well eat some meat. And that's the day that I stopped my year fast of meat. Just go into, well, it was a great burger. Great burger. After a year, oh, I'm telling you. And, and, and they're trying to, let's go back to the scripture we were at, please. They're trying to teach these things. And, and so he's trying to tell them, go and understand what it means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Go learn what that means. The Septuagint, the Greek of the Old Testament, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, translate the word mercy by steadfast love. I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. That's what they mean by mercy. Mercy is love. Without love, there is no mercy. You extend mercy because you love. So there's words that are directly connected. And he is telling them to the, to the Pharisees, you guys have no clue what this is all about. This is not about your religious rituals. This is not about your, your, your lifestyle and what you call to be separate. This is not about that. This, I, you know what I want? Stop all that nonsense. I want you to have mercy. I want you to have love. I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. I want you to reach the outcast. I want you to go for the sinner. That's what he told them, the story of the Good Samaritan. This is what I want people to do. This is what I want the church to be like. The church needs to be there, loving the sinner. Right? But in order for you to love the sinner, there's one thing, one thing that you have to get out of your life. And it's a judgmental attitude. You cannot love the sinner if you have a judgmental attitude. What, is the, what was the sin of the Pharisees? You know what the what sin of the Pharisees was? That they thought they were better. That was the sin of the Pharisees. They thought we're better. We're a higher breed. We are a higher dimension of spirituality. And they saw people as insignificant they saw them as heathens you know to the pharisees peter was a heathen to the pharisees peter was a heathen yet peter was the greatest apostle that jesus raised up did jesus raise them up because he was the greatest apostle no jesus raised them up because he was an average fisherman and he said, you know what? That's the kind of people I need. I just need average Joes to come and show what heaven is all about. Just come over here. You, hey, tax collector. This is when he calls Matthew. Tax collector, come follow me. Tax collectors were seen as bad people because they stole money when they're doing taxes. So he said, hey, you, Matthew, follow me. And the Pharisees are like, oh. No way. Rabbi, Mr. Rabbi, is calling Matthew to be his disciple. They're probably laughing. This guy is a joke. This guy is a joke. And he said, listen, hey, guys, why don't you go to Hosea and try to decide for this. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. They're like, the eyes get crossed. Like, what in the world is this guy talking about? For I came not to call the righteous, but I came to call sinners. This is the people that I'm going for. I'm going to call the sinners. I'm trying to follow and to find the sinners. Hallelujah. So, so Jesus is trying to teach us. Jesus is trying to teach us how to recognize people and how to rightly judge. And it's interesting that the Pharisees were not, were not seeing this, that Jesus is calling normal people. The only religious man that he calls is Paul. 
The rest were just average people, fishermen, tax collectors, a physician, different people. He just said, come, 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 follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to do something great through you guys. Why? Because you're not great. You're normal. And that's what heaven is all about. It's God wants to grab everybody. Understand that this is for everybody. So that's why later on in the same chapter, chapter 9, look what he says in, in, in chapter 9. In verse 35, 9.35. He says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Look at that word. They were what? Harass. They were harassed. He saw his people, his, his Jews, they're like, they're being harassed. By who? Just don't be afraid of it. Say it. There's none here, so you're okay. <laughs> That's the good news, that we don't have them here. But he's saying they are harassed. And besides being harassed, they're helpless. There's nothing they can do. And like sheep without a shepherd. And look at verse number 37. Then he said to his disciples, after seeing this, after seeing the circumstances, he comes to a conclusion. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are what? Are few. You know why? This is what I felt God was dealing with me this morning. You know why he says the laborers are few? Look at the setting back there. There was no few laborers. There was a whole host of every one of the 12 tribes of Israel. There was host of religious people that knew Torah, that knew the Tanakh. They were back and forth, upside down, from the back to the front. They could quote it. They knew the word. There was not a lack of religiosity in that place. There was not a lack of word. There was not a lack of scripture. But when he saw it, he says, there's nobody I can use. There's, there's nobody here. He says the, the laborers are very few. Why? Because they're all bad. They have bad fruit. Right? They have bad fruit. So then he says, we need you. He, he looks at his little disciples, the fishermen, the tax collector, the little guys, the destitutes, the ones that the, the, the Pharisees will laugh at them. They were a joke to, to the Pharisees and scribes and the Sanhedrin. They were like, these guys are a joke. His disciples, Jesus, the rabbi, and he's crazy. Imagine the jokes they will make about Jesus and his disciples. Because you understand, the Pharisees will be very dignified. I mean, they walked, they were rich people. They were not poor. They were rich with their very incredible, you know, expensive clothing. And they'll walk with their big hats and everything, hands in. And it's like they're hovering, you know, through the earth. That's how they walked. And, and so he's looking, at, he's, looking, he's looking at this. And then here's this, this fisherman, this regular people. They just dress like everybody else. They just look like everybody else. And then he's saying, hey, you guys, come over here. We're going to change the world. We're going to turn this upside down. We're going to change the world. And, and this is what I think. Here Jesus is looking. I cannot use all this fruit around. It's bad fruit. Uh, but you guys, you guys, I can use you. Why? Because you guys have not been spoiled. You have not been spoiled. And he grabs them and he come and he he sends them, he commissions them to be sent to the harvest, and then he tells them, therefore pray earnestly. Verse number 38. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send our laborers into his harvest. 
He says, pray that God will have more laborers to be sent. Do not spoil the harvest. Because you can spoil the harvest. You knew that? You can spoil the harvest. How? By bad fruit. Jesus told the, the Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees did not have an evangelistic problem. They were good evangelists. They were excellent evangelists. But they were spoiling people. There's a scripture where Jesus tells the Pharisees, Oh, woe to you Pharisees, that you can walk miles for one proselyte. He said, you will take a journey for one person, for one proselyte. It was a proselyte. Somebody that's going to become a Jew. They're like, oh, wow, we're going, we're going over the hills, over the rivers, over the oceans to get that one person that's going to become a Jew. It says, you walk miles to, for one proselyte to make him a son of the devil. This is Jesus' words. Is it the proselyte's fault? No. The Pharisees have bad fruit. So they walk. They don't have an evangelistic problem. They will go as far as they can to reach that person. But then they spoil them. And Jesus says, We're not, we don't need this anymore. You need to go and preach the gospel. That's what you need to worry about. You need to worry about preaching the word. That is, uh, that is like us going out of our way to reach somebody for Christ, to reach somebody for Jesus, and then read them the bylaws when they walk in. Just be like, hey, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, you know, you see, you're not accepted with this, with this, with this, or without this, this, and that. And then we start telling people, how is it that heaven will accept them? Now think about that. We're telling them, how is it that heaven will accept them? Like if we are heaven. We're telling, this is what heaven will accept. And then we read the scriptures. And Jesus constantly told, like the woman, hey, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Go and do, don't, don't keep doing the sin in your life. You just need to get over it. See, Jesus is looking for laborers today. Today. That understand mercy. Amen? That understand mercy. That are willing to eat with the sinners. That are willing to eat with the publicans. That are willing to have fruit character that your life will show that you belong to heaven not your dress your life do you understand what i'm saying your life your life is what lets know heaven who you are yes. amen that's how heaven recognizes you when they see you what is your life what is it that jesus said inwardly I can see inwardly. I can see your heart. I can see you. What is that? What type of witness is that giving? Amen? And that's what he wants us to go out there and start loving people. Jesus is the best thing that can happen to anybody. Don't make it the worst thing. Because he is the best thing that can happen to anybody. Amen. So I think a lot of times Jesus is grieved when we make him the worst thing. He's grieved when bad fruit is out there representing him. Bad fruit is out there judging. Bad fruit is out there measuring people. Be careful. Measuring others. You will be measured the same way. I've always said it. I prefer to be in the side of mercy. 
that in the side of judgment. Because I have long understood Matthew 5 when he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Do you want mercy? Be merciful. How are you not, how are you merciful? How are you more merciful? Don't judge. It's different. You know, sin is sin. There's biblical sin. The Bible tells you what sin is and it has to do with morality. You will see it. You will recognize it. And even in that case, you're not judging it. You know the Bible already judged it. God already knows that that is sin. Jesus knew they were sinners. Yet, he was loving them. Right? Yet he was with them, loving them so that they can see the light. So that they can come out of sin into the marvelous light of Jesus. Yes. So we need, to, we need to start loving more. We need to start being more merciful and understanding that God needs laborers that love and have mercy. Understand, you need, you need to understand more mercy than sacrifice. Because a lot of times, what we call sacrifice becomes pride. A lot of times, what we call sacrifice becomes pride. Oh, I did this. I do this. I'm like this. As we stand up. I remember that I had a huge issue of pride in my heart. Religious pride. Where I would think, oh, nobody's fasting like I'm fasting. Nobody's praying like I'm praying. Nobody's out on the streets like I am. Everybody's a bunch of heathens here in this church. That's where I grew up, not here. Thank God. I had that attitude. I had the attitude. Why? Because my sacrifice had become pride. It had become pride. Just like the Pharisees. Their sacrifice became pride because they focused their life on the wrong aspect. They focused their life on sacrifice rather than focusing their life on mercy. We need to focus our lives on mercy. Amen. Amen. Who is the one that changes? His name is Jesus. Amen. Has, did he change you? Amen. He changed me. You know how he changed me? He just came to me. I didn't have anybody preaching to me. I had no family, nobody. My mother was not a Christian yet. I didn't have somebody calling me, Grandma, Grandpa. Hey, Renee, stop doing this. You're doing wrong. You know, I understand we, it, we're going to guide our children and everything. But the ultimate agent of changer is Jesus. He is the one that reaches to the heart, to the soul, and changes things. What is it that helps Jesus along the way? Love. Amen. When you love them. If we love them and Jesus is working with us, we are unstoppable. Heaven will be unstoppable. Because that's what Jesus called us. And we understand there's definitely strong lines between us and the world there's many things we're not going to partake there's many things i'm not going to do absolutely but i have to change my attitude to mercy we have to have mercy understand mercy 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 is what god is desiring from us he is desiring for us to understand him to go after him you see, He is a loving God and a merciful God. Amen. That's the God that the world is longing to see. Amen. That's the God that the world is longing to love. Thank God there's many people out there bringing back that image of Jesus. Because there's been many that have been harassed and helpless. Many throughout the ages have been harassed and helpless by organized religion 
But Jesus is calling out people, waking them up. Hey, wake up. Wake up. I need you to love. Wake up. I need you to have mercy. Wake up. I need you to represent me. Stop representing your thing. Your religion. Start representing me. Heaven. I'm watching character and your life. This is what I'm looking for. Character in your life. The fruit. What fruit are we having? What fruit as a church are we producing? What fruit are we producing in our lives? That's what God is after. Oh, hallelujah. When we close our eyes for a moment and raise our hands to Jesus. And let's just ask Him to help us. Help us have right fruit. Help us have the right fruit in our lives. We need fruit. We need to produce fruit. Oh God, help us not be entrapped by the webs of appearance. Help us not be trapped by the webs of